Seattle is months away from entering a period of steep economic decline, fueled in part by the dot-com bust. In retrospect, it's hard to fathom the type of internet you had to first kick your sister off the landline in order to use. It created such a bubble. Several years later, tens of thousands of people will pour into Seattle, rebuilding its economic engine more powerful than ever. Yet, as prosperity flourishes, new hardships emerge. This film explores several Seattleites willing to share how they've interacted with their community during a period of rapid change. Journey with us for a brief glimpse into their story. Well, thank you. I want to, first of all, officially welcome everybody to Seattle's family room. The Seattle Center is a very special place. And, you know, in our own homes, you invite strangers into your living room. But you invite the people you really like into your family room, and that's where we are today. Bumbershoot 2003 is, again, a, a celebration of the arts in Seattle that began in 1971. It began as the Mayor's Arts Festival. It was an idea that Seattle stole from New York. John Lindsay, the mayor of New York, had started a Mayor's Arts Festival. Mayor Wes Ullman saw it, liked it, saw that Seattle was going into some tough times, the Boeing Depression, and said, we need to do something that sparks this city. A Mayor's Arts Festival is gonna be part of that. And so here we are today, 32 years later, celebrating that legacy and reconnecting the city and its cultural and artistic life. Our city has been experiencing tough times one more time, but we have a very bright future. And we've got a bright future because we have a creative population. We have people who invented commercial aircraft, who invented the information age, who invented the idea that you could charge $3 for a cup of coffee and people would like it. <laughs> we are very creative and what keeps us creative is our active and dynamic cultural and artistic life. And I want to thank, I see two, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> It's got to be the 95 season for the Mariners, wasn't it? Sure, and we got we won the American League West, and it was the, uh, there's never been anything like that in this town, I don't think, except maybe the Sonics, when they, they, they took it all in 79, but uh, that season of the Mariners is, I'll never forget, and it all happened right over there. When I worked at Seattle Fire, uh, I worked in Pioneer Square, and there were a lot of masonry buildings in that area. Uh, when the earthquake hit, I had just walked past the Phoenix Underground uh, after I got a cup of coffee and went to the conference room, and the building was starting to shake, and we heard the sound of the sand below it, the liquefaction associated with it. A lot of buildings were very much damaged in the Pioneer Square area, and so I also was able to get information from construction and land use to find out where the buildings were red tagged and where the masonry buildings were, and I provided maps to our uh, firefighting support and to the chief to make sure that firefighters would be safe in going to these buildings or they would not go into these buildings. There was a lot done after that to retrofit the buildings, but still it was quite a, an experience. The city recently sold eight parcels of land to city investors, a company owned by Paul Allen for the price of $21 million. Now the mayor wants to take that money and redevelop things here at South Lake Union Park, help pedestrians get around a little better in this area and improve the traffic mess.
I was informed that the ownership of the Seattle Supersonics have made a business decision to sell the team. When I moved here, uh, downtown Seattle was thriving and just a dream come true. Because you had Pike Place Market, you had Nordstrom, you had the old Bon Marche, now Macy's. Uh, Third Avenue was packed with, with stores and restaurants and the shopping district that ran along Fifth Avenue past Nordstrom was again packed with places to shop and uh, great restaurants and uh, in the summertime people were on the streets, they were happy, they were smiling. Uh, my name is Roger Lazola. Stand up comedian. I started in uh, 2003 here in Seattle, Washington at the Comedy Underground. The Comedy Underground was my home club. This is where the engineer hangs out. This is his workshop. Uh, this is the gym. So we don't, uh, so all we're doing is constantly eating and sitting around. So we try not to be 500 pounds when we leave this boat, so that's the gym. The gym is where you make it. So this is the engine room. So you got your two mains and your generators on either side. Yeah, get the shot that way. We're docked here in Ballard, Washington, and we sail from Ballard, Washington to uh, Prince of Wales Island, a little town called Craig, um, and we dock there, and then we go out fishing for the rest of the, the summer. And then this, this is an escape hatch, just in case we go down. <laughs> And I didn't even get a full taste of Seattle because I didn't have a vehicle. So I was just on the bus and whatever I would see on the bus. You see wild things, like there was a protest. I didn't know there was, there was just a day that Seattle stopped doing things and just started protesting things. They're like, yeah, it was like Festivus. They were just airing the grievances out. It was just something that I didn't experience growing up. Like, uh, we didn't have that many brothers in, in where I grew up at. We had some uh, Asian cats. Um, but other than that, it was white people and Mexican people. That's it. I mean, like culturally, it was a lot different from what I came from. I mean, Seattle is, yeah, the majority is is white cats. But like for me, it was it was like it was like New York City because I didn't I never experienced it, and it was just fun to hang around. I just I I enjoyed it. I would like you to bring back cool. I would like you to be cool again, Seattle. You're not cool anymore. You're like in your 40s and you're starting to turn a little trying to turn that corner because the bills are piling up and you have kids too young and there's too many people at your house and there are people outside in the street and there's no cool anymore man you're not cool i think seattle's gone through some transition and rough times some of it sparked by the industry that we cover here at geekwire uh the tech industry which is just 
mushroomed in the last 10, 15 years. That's created a lot of uh, strains and challenges for the region. But even with that, I look around and I investigate other places and there's no other place I'd want to I'd want to live really at the end of the day. Uh, this is home. I love it. I love the mentality. I like the mindset. I love that it's a innovative, creative place. It's progressive, maybe a little too progressive at times, but um, it is forward looking for the most part. Uh, I feel like we've maybe lost a little bit of our mojo through COVID and in the last year or two, um, but I'm hopeful and I hope the community can rally together and come together to really make Seattle a place that is that place of the future, a forward-looking place, an innovative and creative place. And I have faith and hope that that will happen here and there's as good a chance that it can happen here as any place else in the country or planet. It's a big miss by many of the corporate leaders here that they don't do more to engage and come together as a community to try to solve some of these problems. Um, and, and I know many are doing a lot, but I feel like we almost need a, a rallying cry. to be a bicycle commuter and I got a new job as a telecommuter. And I found the old Ballard Skate Bowl, the original Skate Bowl, uh, down here. And uh, I had my old skateboard and some pads and tried it out and, and got hooked on it and met people who I skated with. And there was also a real vigorous online community even before Facebook was that popular. And so I just met this huge group of people who wanted to preserve the skate bowl here in Ballard and right about that same time the the going plan was to demolish the skate bowl and build this park here with no no skateboarding feature and so I have a background I used to be a, a public speaking teacher and a debate coach and a high school teacher and so I just used some of those skills to engage in the political process and and me and many other people were involved and we got this, this bowl built here and uh, other skate parks built in Seattle too. And suddenly we began to realize there was a lot of um, crime up on Aurora. A whole lot of crime. There had been shootings. There were people who had been hurt by running or killed by running across Aurora where there was no pedestrian access, even though it was a block from the underpass. Um, there was a shooting in the motel that's right up here. And there was a lot of prostitution. But we kind of ignored it because we knew it had been there for a long time. And then one day, a car jumped its brakes down here on Allen, rolled down the hill, and smashed into our car and totaled it. And we called the cops, of course, and it turned out to be a stolen car that had rolled down the hill. And the policewoman who came simply said, well, you know, you need to talk to your city council person. So I called my city council person, of course, who said, well, there's not much we can do. Um, but there is this group that you might want to get in touch with. And it turned out that there was a group called Fawn, Fremont Aurora Wallingford Neighbors, that had recently formed because they too were con concerned about the public safety issues that were going on. And what they had organized was to get together a group of folks, maybe eight or 10 people, that walked with vests and hats on all the way up Aurora from 39th, or maybe even from the Troll, up to um, about 
46th or 50th, and then did a loop back down the other side and looked for tagging, looked for street lights out, looked for issues that they saw once a week and reported those to what we, what has become Find It, Fix It. What also is working are the, are the cleanups and it's a very visible sign that, uh, that we care about this neighborhood and we're making a difference. Getting the litter under control helps create a whole new feeling along this stretch of Aurora. And look at this, that's a pretty good model for what we're working on. Well, I think in a place like Seattle, especially, uh, being active in your community means that you're engaged in a process that's going to produce something for the public good. Try to find uh, groups of like-minded individuals, and that's where the real power of community comes from, is when you have a number of people involved in a cause. and. Um, if you can find a foothold in a place like, for skate parks, it was a, a matter of finding a foothold in the parks department uh, to build different facilities. And I don't know how it is in other kinds of civic engagements, but it definitely took a, a process and a, a large group of people to make it happen. The building will come down. This will be largely a passive park with trees and open spaces. It'll serve as, as the Ballard uh, Town Square in a way. We have to talk about love back in Seattle. The Northwest, this, the country's watching what we do here. We gotta show this country that we are a Northwest area full of compassion, full of love, full of helping each other out. So thank you for coming back. Seattle is back, thank you very much. It's really a head-spinning level of change that's happening here, and um, some are embracing it, some are enjoying it, and very many are, are getting left behind. This was going to be a crisis that was hard to avoid. I mean, the disparity in wealth is an issue that is happening in many communities. I think it's especially stark here, as I said, uh, because of the boom of the tech economy, and it happened just so fast. My name is Tanya Wu. I've lived, grew up, and worked in Seattle my entire life. I grew up in Beacon Hill. My family had a business here in the Chinatown International District, and I now live in the Rainier Valley area. Um, I went to school here. I went and tried to 
get into journalism, worked at the local uh, NBC station for about 10 years, but left to help redevelop my family building, which we are at right now, um, Louise Hotel, which provides 84 units of workforce housing and ground floor commercial tenant spaces. And I worked really hard doing that for a couple of years. Um, during the pandemic, I helped lead a group called the Chinatown International District Community Watch. Uh, we go out a couple times a week to walk around the neighborhood, make sure everyone's okay, businesses, residents. Um, we go into the encampments. We do things like de-escalate fights. We provide Narcan, we've done CPR, provide mutual aid and meals to our house residents. So just basically whatever the community needed. And um, today I'm also running for Seattle City Council. Don't be afraid to talk to somebody. Don't be afraid to like connect, do a good deed, um, join a, participate. Connect in a way that's regular. So I don't know what it is about modern day life, but there's, there's a lot of like scheduling that needs to take place. And I think it's really helpful to have activities that are locked in on a regular basis. So game night with your friends or dinner once a month, walk around Green Lake weekly, but something that's already in your calendar with specific people so that you don't have to exert energy to text or call or to get something on your calendar. It's just really nice to have things that are anchored already. Like noises before or? I don't know, I was trying to like maybe come up with a synth thing for concrete for in the parts that I'm not playing. Okay. Because I feel like on the studio recording there's some synth players. I haven't listened to them in so long, I could not tell you what, if you say so. So I was going to try to figure something out. Okay. I mean, yeah, whatever you want to do. But I, I guess the question is if you're going to do it before I start playing the guitar or so. stuff. Like I bring a riff to practice and show these guys and if they like it we'll develop it and they'll figure out their parts and then I'll come up with like both. Bring a riff and then Miles and I will do one of these. <laughs> oh well, yeah your name. I mean you'll bring a riff but then we'll sort of re uh, we'll kind of rework the arrangement sometimes collectively. Yeah. April 5th is our release show at the sunset. Hey, I'm Dylan Fuentes. I'm in the band Weep Wave. Uh, we're a post-punk psych band from Seattle, Washington. The Seattle music scene is made up of a bunch of pockets of different types of bands and genres, and they all kind of like have their own little neighborhoods and venues that they play at, but there's a lot of diversity in the style and genres of music going on here. Orchestral. It's an it hip-hop orchestral. Violin, trumpet, I'm not used to that. That's what we're going for. Is that right? Yes. Just kind of blow it open. Exactly. So that, that song is called uh, Other Side. Other Side, yes. It's obviously about the diff, the dark side of the world of what? Drugs? Drug addiction, yeah. 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 And Drug so what, and what are you kind of saying here? Well, I wanted to uh, kind of give a different perspective to a genre that oftentimes is 
glorify some drug yeah, use right, and right. give my own personal story and tell the story of someone else yeah. and give a different spin on and it. And when it's personal, it's very powerful. Yes. Okay. Let's introduce the band. And by the way, everyone on this stage here is local, kind of yeah. local, born and raised. And so I borrowed 3,000 bucks from my dad to make a pilot episode. It was super short. Five minutes, we did little profiles of artists, a little tiny calendar of events, and it ran as an interstitial program, a five-minute program on KCTS, which is PBS here in Seattle, and on the Seattle Channel. And eventually that show morphed into what is now Art Zone, which is a half-hour local Seattle show dedicated to the Northwest art scene. It's a couch that I got in Centralia for this event? No, I just had the couch and it seemed like it was low enough so it wouldn't obscure people's views. But we did stories on artists that ended up blowing up. Uh, the Blue Scholars, which were these uh, hip-hop duo, these awesome guys, Sobsy and Geo. Geo's still around in Seattle. We did a tiny City of Go Go story on them before they really kind of went off and, you know, kind of made a much bigger splash. We also did a, a story on Macklemore before he hit. And he, he, was, he was a delightful guy. So it's really kind of fun to look at these people that we were able to get to, which we would never have been able to get to once they had become a big deal. And it's kind of, you know, kind of say, oh, this is kind of cool, you know, to our audience. Hey, look at this guy, look at these two. And then they end up going, you know, they end up kind of making, making it big. Certainly in the music community, Seattle can stand on its own with any city in this country. And as a result, any city in the world. Well, that's it for City A Go Go. Thanks so much for watching. And as always, we encourage you to get out there, try something new, and experience the awesome and literary power of art. We'll see you next time. One of the reasons I love jazz is that it doesn't sit still. And I've always thought that jazz and Seattle, particularly since um, the year 2000 and beyond, when we've really been evolving as a technological hub, and um, you know, a blue city. I think that the, the parallels between jazz and the city of Seattle are many, and I think they're profound. Um, jazz is living in the past, present, and future. And, um, you know, obviously acknowledging its past as a cultural treasure of black America. Um, here in Seattle, that kind of fluid response to the changes in our uh, circumstances, the way that jazz, you know, deals with structure, but also deals with innovation and improvisation. It deals with fluid thinking, it deals with being in the moment. And the way that the city of Seattle has evolved over the last 20 years or so um, is a real apt parallel for, uh, for, for jazz. Dr. James Gore, and I'm going to ask uh, John Galbraith if they would join me up here, and I get to do one of the fun uh, powers that come with the office. You don't talk about this in campaigns much, but uh, I get to declare and proclaim pretty much anything I want uh, as long as I'm in this office, and that's great. And so it is my great pleasure today to uh, declare October 22nd to 29th, 2005 to be Jazz Week in Seattle, and I encourage every citizen of Seattle to join me in celebrating our jazz scene's jubilant history, thriving present, and promising future. Thank you. We're here in the basement of the Louisa Hotel at Club Royale, one of the many jazz clubs that used to be in the Chinatown International District in the 1930s. There would be three doorways they have to go through before they go into the club, but people would be here for an evening of fun. And you know, these murals here are significant because they're evidence of black music being played in a Chinese neighborhood enjoyed by blacks, whites, and pretty much everybody and shows the diversity of our communities despite segregation and and everything else that was happening pre-civil rights era. I am confident that the, you know, the, the city will be a place for art and culture. It'll be a place, continue to be a place that values art and culture. Although artists continue to do their thing and they'll, they'll never stop, it's become, I think, more difficult because space is more expensive, housing is more expensive, and people get dispersed. They can't stay in their little communities. And that's a huge loss. That's a huge loss. 
Hello community, I'm Burns. I'm in charge of construction of the Block Project for Facing Homelessness. A recent count performed by the King County Regional Homelessness Authority estimated that over 40,000 people are experiencing homelessness in King County. Block Project is a, is a community project. It's not a housing project, although the end product is a tangible home that uh, provide stability and safety for someone experiencing homelessness. Uh, it's all community supported. Community builds the homes, they provide the land. Homeowners are volunteering their backyards for uh, our community to build a block home. And they also provide continued connection through the companionship program to our residents living in the block home have a really high success rate of helping people stay housed with, either with us or moving on to other permanent housing of 95%. Um, it's a lot higher than a lot of other temporary or um, kind of tiny home solutions that are out there. Our basic core principle is just say hello. Start with something really small. Start with a powerful act of connection where you make eye contact with somebody, smile, ask them how they are. It can be incredibly powerful, both for, powerful for both of you. I advocate exuding a kind of energy where you really tune in to someone and you can imagine what they're like as a child. You can imagine that they're human just like you when they have hopes and dreams and they've had losses and they've had pain and just see more deeply into someone rather than walking by. Then I would say like just start looking at how you can get involved. There are tons of different organizations that are working to address homelessness. We are one of them and we would love to have people come learn what we're about, volunteer with us, make new community and relationships. Um, it's really rewarding and really wonderful. 2010s we've seen a physical transformation, an economic transformation, and a cultural transformation. There's a period of time um, you know, maybe after 2010, where Amazon starts to grow so rapidly, hiring more than 10,000 workers a year, recruiting them from all over the country and bringing them to Seattle. And so the city just sort of explodes in prosperity at that time. And there's this big distinction between Microsoft and Amazon. Microsoft sets up their campus in Redmond. So in the 1980s, that's when companies were headed to the suburbs, because uh, that's where a lot of workers were. And the 1980s were a more prosperous time in the suburbs than in the city. 1990s, people are starting to return to the city. And when Amazon sets up, it's not at some suburban office park. They are setting up right in the middle of the city of Seattle. And so it's drawing a lot of prosperity into the city. It's drawing a lot of those educated tech workers into the nearby neighborhoods. And that's, you start to see this transition. So Seattle had this reputation as kind of a blue collar town. Um, the manufacturing base was what contributed to that. Um, in, the, in the neighborhoods that are close to the water, you had fishermen, you had shipbuilders, and that, that economic transition to tech brought kind of a demographic transition as well. We see Google, Facebook, uh, all these companies having big engineering offices here in Seattle to get the talent that Amazon's bringing in and Seattle is keeping here. The interesting thing about tech in, in Seattle is that it is, is cheaper to live here and to have your high-end employees here than it is in Silicon Valley. So that's one of the big reasons that we've attracted so many of these uh, high-end labs and R&D operations of Silicon Valley firms. In a lot of neighborhoods, you have these houses that were built for kind of middle-class, blue-collar workers. Those houses are now super expensive. You know, a, a small house built in the 1950s might be close to a million dollars these days. And so what that does is it drives this, this, this transition to the city to higher paid workers. And one of the things that you see happening along with that is that in a lot of these sectors of the economy that are traditionally lower paying, the service sector, restaurants, retail, all that kind of stuff, um, you start to see evidence of a labor shortage picking up, you know, going back 10 years. So almost immediately after the Great Recession. The high housing costs are leading to a situation where people who are trying to make ends meet on the basis of this low-wage work are finding it more difficult. 
um, they're moving away or they're deciding not to move here in the first place. And so in some of these industries, you start to see, hey, you know, if I want to hire somebody to wash dishes in Seattle, I can't find anybody if I just pay the minimum wage. I've got to pay a little bit more. Homelessness has a connection to housing prices. Why do people become homeless? Many reasons, but one of them is they might have a job, they might have some income, but they can't afford a place. So they are living in their vehicle. They are, you know, in shelters, wherever they are. Um, so I think that if, if we made headway on the housing crisis, this would make a big difference to a lot of the other problems that we see in Seattle. There's this struggle that as a city grows, the question is how can a city grow equitably? How can it grow in a way that lifts everybody up uh, and not just uh, those who uh, can afford uh, the amenities that, that start coming in here? You could look at a lot of cities in the United States and say there was something similar that they, they made this transition to a manufacturing economy and then they went post-industrial. I think the difference in Seattle is that our post-industrial economy is more successful and larger than our industrial economy ever was. And it's leading us, you know, there, there, if you go to the East Coast, for example, there are a lot of East Coast cities that were super big manufacturing cities around 1950, and then they shrank a lot. And now they are only just now kind of getting back to where their population was around 1950. Well, here in Seattle, our population now is bigger than it's ever been. And so the boom for us has taken us beyond where we had ever seen the population or the, the level of prosperity exist. You know, if you go back to 1950, 1960, when we were a blue collar town. I don't know what it is about ice cream shops, but every like kind of larger city has like kind of a crazy anarchist ice cream store. My wife and I thought if we opened a business here, then somebody else would, and it would kind of revitalize the neighborhood. And it seemed to have worked so far. So we're still going after all this time. There's a lot of new businesses here. There's really no vacancies. I hadn't made a large batch of ice cream, like we make it in three gallons, until the day before we opened. Um, like we'd made lots of little test batches. And so a lot of the flavors are like things that either I grew up with or I wanted to reflect the neighborhood. Um, like there's a pretty famous taco truck in the neighborhood. And so we make an horchata ice cream. I had a friend that worked at Sub Pop and I asked him like, <clears throat> if I can talk to Mark Arm, because I really want to make a mud honey flavor. They're just one of my favorite bands. And uh, they agreed to it. And we made a bunch of samples and the band tried it and we kind of landed on a flavor. Then I asked like an email that was like, hey, do you want to play my shop for, uh, for the opening? And I didn't hear from them. Like they had just played the Space Needle on top of the Space Needle. And then like two weeks later, he emailed me back and was like, sure, we can do this date. And so, yeah, they, they played my shop for the release of the ice cream. It's like, I think the whole country is having the same issue with like a lot of people on opiates and a lot of people just broke and there's a lot of people that are just really desperate. There's just a lot more people, you know, and with more people comes more of everything, good and bad. So like I was just downtown today and it's, it's kind of like shocking and sad to see what downtown has become. Um, and you know, most of that I'm gonna blame like the pandemic, like it just, it shuttered a lot of businesses. It's more expensive to live, but people are gonna find a way. And I think there's a great crop of bands coming out of Seattle right now. Like it's getting weird again. There's bands like Beautiful Freaks and Zoo Crocs and all these really fun, like crazy bands that are coming out of Seattle. There's a lot of amazing art in Seattle. People are doing amazing things here. People aren't gonna stop living their lives. Like people are still gonna create, they're still gonna open businesses. You know, they're gonna live. Um, so I don't know if because of like our economy right now, things are gonna happen, but things are gonna happen despite it maybe. That I think just the nature of Seattle, um, I think creates great artists and musicians. 
and thinkers and innovators. Like, there's a lot of amazing things that have come out of Seattle. Welcome, welcome. So first and foremost, we got the Neo Geo here. The cabinet's not OG, but the guts are legit. So uh, we've got a, a roster of games. This is uh, the original Beacon, Seattle's Beacon Cinema. No relation. That was actually up on Beacon Hill. We're at the very bottom down here. But uh, that picture, I think, judging by the posters in the windows there, it's from 1931. If you look very closely, there's a cat chilling. So when we moved in here in 2019, it had previously been a yoga studio. Before that, this was a convenience store for a long time. But uh, me and my original business partner, Casey, and with a lot of help from his dad, we built it out and uh, transformed it into this little sun. It's The landscape has changed a lot. Uh, on 50th, there's, there was Grand Illusion Cinema, which is now in its final year in that location. Scarecrow Video, the, uh, the original Seven Gables Theater, and then underneath that, there was Cinema Books, which was this incredible bookstore run by this woman named uh, Stephanie Ogle. And you would walk in there and it would just be mountains of books that seemed like completely chaotic. And you could go in and ask her about anything. It was, you know, I want a book on Louis Fouillard, Silent French Cinema go down, pull it out. Here's the only one ever written in English. Got it for you. So there's this unbelievable, like, rich environment where movies just permeated that neighborhood. And uh, it, it seeped into me. So, you know, coming back to Seattle after having lived away for a long time, seeing how, how many fewer opportunities there were for cinema going and just engaging with cinema culture, really perceived that there was a need for, for someone to sort of pick up the torch and like keep, keep sharing movies, keep creating a public space where people can gather together and experience you know, the collectivity of being an audience and responding to something in a, that shared environment. When I think about Seattle, it's a, I have a mixed relationship to it. It's like, it's complicated. It's my home and I love it because this is where my roots are. This is where my family is. So many of my friends are still here. And so many of my memories are still here. But it's hard, like, you know, watching a place change so much, getting gentrified, seeing so many people get priced out. The idea of opening a small business is a terrifying proposition. It's, you know, there's so much risk involved and uh, it's, it's really overwhelming. And it's not something that I had any experience, you know, on the, the administrative executive end of doing ever before. So, uh, you know, with my original business partner, we just made the plunge, took the leap, and uh, were guided by, you know, a conviction that it mattered, that, you know, this is what we believed in, this is what we wanted to contribute to the city. So, you know, we took the risk, and it's been paying off, not in a, a financial windfall, but, you know, we've made it through some hard times, we're still here, and it's really just so gratifying the way that we've been embraced by the community. The neighborhood here in Columbia City has been, you know, so positive in their response. We have so many local regulars who come in on a like, weekly basis, and it's, uh, it's, it means a lot to have the opportunity to, you know, do what I like, do what I love, you know, bring my vision for the city to life and for it to be embraced and for other people to share it. It's really special. What's most important for you to pursue in your life? Just taking a moment now to feel what it's like when you're in touch with your heart energy of this really matters to me. How do you act? How do you talk? What kind of energy do you exude? And how do you bring that type of energy and action into your life?
in a way that makes your own life better and the lives of people around you. I arrived home and just felt this like gush of love for Seattle. I never forget seeing going around that one turn on I-5 when the city's revealed and just feeling like like I was going to the Emerald, well, literally like the Emerald City <laughs> in Wizard of Oz. Um, and the songs that the presidents had, you know, all the songs on the debut record, with the exception of a few that existed beforehand, were sort of imbued with this like joy of rediscovering my roots and, and finally feeling that there was somewhere I could actually plant roots and be and invest in. My hope, my dream, my goal is to convince the city of Seattle to let us build saunas on in parks on the water. Uh, I'd like to have in the Nordic countries so that we can do uh, like in out sauna, cold plunge, sauna, cold plunge. And really the, the, the goal of that is like make it available for as many people as possible. I hope in the future, I, I hope that the ways that we're getting disconnected as a city will get more resolved and in, in that the infrastructure will become such that we're just going to be more and more connected and care more about one another. You know, let's not give up on our city and our community. I'm not going to give up.